There is very little in this world that is more prized than ownership. Owners have power, they have say, they have rights, and they tend to use the things they already own to end up with even more. Nobody wants to be owned. If a young person looks at you and points and says, owned, you know something just like absolutely awful has happened. I read this thing in Bloomberg Business Week about the other secret inside a can of Coke. It's those liners that keep the soda from meeting the metal. In 2017, a Coke chemist took photos and files of the recipe for that liner. She took them to China and she tried to make them herself. It did not work. She got caught, she got convicted, she got sentenced to 14 years. What property is worth fighting for? And why do so many people end up owning nothing? It's a problem, we're gonna take ownership of it together tonight. It's the business show. Welcome to the Business Week Show. Tonight, ownership. In 2016, a small restaurant in Harlem burned down and its owner, who was sitting with me at this table, did not have fire insurance. She ended up getting evicted and she lost her car and she was even hit with a tax bill. In 2018, she had an idea, slutty vegan. Five years after that, Pinky Cole is the owner of a plant-based restaurant chain with 13 locations and famed burgers like the One Night Stand and a reported valuation of 100 million dollars. Pinky Cole is here to tell us about ownership and a lot more, and I'm really glad she is. Pinky Cole, welcome. Thanks for having me. I love that intro, it was good. Thank you so much. <laughs> the people who succeed in business, they sometimes have a really hard time owning up to a lot of, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And especially, I think at the top of the list is, is failure. Yeah. But your new memoir, I Hope You Fail, is based on the idea that failing isn't like the enemy of ownership or, or its opposite, but, but a key part of it. Why, yeah. why? You know, it's interesting when we think about failure, for me anyway, I've been through a lot. My father served 22 years in prison. I grew up in a single parent household. Car got repoed, lost my business, almost lost my mind, had enough bad relationships that I can't even count, right? But I needed all those things to happen for me so that I can realize what was on the other side. Mm -hmm. And what was on the other side was, building a multi-million dollar business, um, creating Slutty Vegan when I had no idea what I was doing as an entrepreneur, becoming a wife and becoming a mother when a doctor told me that I couldn't even have kids. So when we think about failure, it really is just re-engineering a negative mindset. And that's why I wrote the book. I wanted people to know that, okay, it's inevitable. Life is going to happen, but it's what you do with what happens in life is what makes the difference. Um, and I know that it's going to bless a lot of people. When Americans walk into a McDonald's, mm -hmm. when Americans walk into a, a Shake Shack, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they know what they're gonna expect. Exactly. That the corporation is, is banking on that, that mm -hmm. kind of consistency. What should Americans expect, like from the vibe, from the food, maybe from the weight, when they walk into one of your places? You're gonna be called a slut. You're gonna be met with agape energy. You are going to hear music booming through the speakers. We're gonna have employees dancing with you. And then I have full promises, right? We're gonna give you great energy, customer service, our form of training, and cleanliness. That is my promise and my guarantee to the people who walk through the door. And it's not about the food. It's about the experience. I like this idea that the food is, is like kind of the, is almost off to the side. It's almost an extra. But, but let's talk about it though, because selling food is like, it's a complicated thing. Very hard. Is there something about food that you want to get better at? It's really about, about food and about eating? No, but what I have learned, it's funny, I just recently talked to the executive chef at Shake Shack, right? Because, you know, Danny Meyer's team, they're my um, investors. Uh, one part, half of my investors, and the other is uh, New Voices. So I called him and I just wanted some advice on like LTOs, right? And that's limited time offerings. So when you go to a restaurant and like, you know how for six weeks they have like a certain burger, I'm like, I need to be able to make the relationship spicy. So I've been working on new menu items, new ways to excite the customer all over again, especially during the economy when restaurants are at an all time low. Um, but it's been a journey, but it's been a beautiful one nonetheless. You no longer own the business outright. You've got, you've got these two big investors, Danny Myers, one of the one of the big restaurateurs mm -hmm. in the country, and a, but he started Shake Shack. Mm -hmm. 
What have you learned about sharing something that you own? You know, you're no, you're no longer the sole uh, stakeholder. Mm, nobody ever asked me that, but can I be totally transparent? I cried. When it first happened, I cried. And if, where the camera at? My investors, y'all watch this. I love y'all, but I cried, right? But I'm going to tell you why I cried. Because I have never had anything that belonged to me that amassed this level of success. So when it amassed a certain level of success and I did it on my own, I'm like, it's me, it's mine. It's n I'm not sharing like blood, sweat, and tears. I bust my ass to get here. So then when I'm like, okay, all right, we're going to take investment, but that means that you got to give up some equity. I'm like, well, what's that? You got to give up a percentage of your business. What do you mean I got to give up a percentage of my business? And they ain't got to come in here and work physically? No. It was hard for me because my ego was in the way, right? But that's that trauma, that growing up trauma that tells you that, like, if you have something, like, you don't share it, you keep it to yourself. But you go farther together. You want to go far? You got to go with a team. And I knew that in order to get where I wanted to be in my life, I needed to get me a team. And I'm glad that I chose the people to do business with um, because they got my back. And I got the two Michael Jordans on my team. So as long as I got them, I'm a win. If there's anything that could possibly be more intense and important for an owner than her relationship with, with her partners, it's her relationship with her employees. Mm -hmm. We are having like a, a real moment in this country with labor, labor in general, as, as our magazine has documented in the automotive industry, Hollywood. You've had to navigate lawsuits brought by employees. What have you learned about being an owner that you didn't know when you, when you started? That when I show up in the news, they don't just say slutty vegan. They say Pinky Cole is getting sued. Can I tell you a funny story? So I got a nine pager in the New Yorker. One day, the next day, Jet Magazine, I'm on the cover. They hadn't printed in eight years, so we're in Target. Like, I'm all over the internet. It's just beautiful. And then the next day, I'm on the New York Post getting sued mm. for unpaid wages. And how I found out is I was watching Golden Globes, and then after the Golden Globes, like, I'm plastered all over the TV. And... I'm like, that happened? What's going on? Like, I'm trying to find out the information just like they're finding out the information, right? So that was my first experience of feeling defeated in my business because there were a lot of things that I didn't know, obviously, because I don't run the day-to-day -day of the business anymore. I'm still the CEO, um, but I have a president and I have a really solid core team. So when that happened, it threw me for a loop. And to be honest, I got a little bit defeated. I'm like, this is not what I created my business for. I only operate in best practices. Like, I only operate with the highest level of integrity. Anybody that knows me, I don't play with people money. I don't play, you know, like, I don't play with people's opportunities. So, like, when that happened, it really hurt me and I took it personal. And my lawyers was like, don't respond. Don't say nothing. I'm like, F that. So I get on internet and I'm like, I write this whole personal statement, didn't share it with anybody because at the end of the day, I realized that my name is more important to me than anything else. All right, let's talk about the Pinky Cole brand. Yes. So you're you're on the side, I mean, you're, you're a brand strategist in, adi in addition to everything you do, mm -hmm. but Pinky, I mean, you're also a brand. What do you want your empire to look like in, you know, in 10 years from now? Slutty Vegan is a lifestyle brand, right? You know? Depending on the, the day, Slutty Vegan is a marketing company that has restaurants as the storefronts. And when we talk about lifestyle brands, Pepsi is a lifestyle brand. Coca-Cola is a lifestyle brand. Slutty Vegan is a lifestyle brand. I want people to be able to consume the brand not just by way of food, which is why I did a shoe collab and a lipstick collab. I'm working on colognes, reality shows, producing movies. Because when you see this octopus, right, the head is slutty vegan. The tentacles are all the things that are connected to this head. This is the bread and butter. So it doesn't stop at restaurants. Restaurants was just the gateway to get in the door. But I'm going to world dominate with the brand in so many ways and show people that you do not have to be a one trick pony. You can have a multifaceted brand that is sustainable that will last throughout the years. I think I'm gonna take the, the people that I've worked on on the show to Slutty Vegan for I think our, our wrap party sure. when, when the season is over. Oh, that's awesome. is, there, is there like a sleeper, is there a sleeper hit on the menu? Is there something that like we should absolutely definitely get? The chicken head. And the chicken head is a chicken sandwich with coleslaw. 
um, and like a red spicy sauce. It's so good. But beyond the food, I really want you to get the experience of a lifetime. All of this will not make sense until you walk into the doors of my church. It is really the premier restaurant chain that has the potential to change lives beyond just food. Even without going there, it's just a good time being in a room with you and being able to talk to you, and I appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. I really I enjoyed it. You. Really enjoyed it. Thank Pinky you. Cole, thank you so much. The United States is the richest country in the world, and the competition is not close. And yet, there are 38 million people here who cannot afford basic necessities. There are 2 million people here who don't have access to running water or flushing toilets where they live. And there are 1 million kids in public schools who have no home. How could that be? The guest who's with me at this table has a theory. In Matthew Desmond's moving and convincing new book, Poverty by America, he argues that poverty persists because the rest of us, the owners, want it to. He is a sociologist at Princeton. He is the founder and the principal investigator at its eviction lab. He has a Pulitzer Prize in nonfiction and is here to talk to us about what he's learned. Matthew Desmond, welcome. Oh man, so good to be here. Really happy to have you. So you write in this book that complexity is the refuge of the powerful. Tell us with as much simplicity as possible, why are there so many who own so little and are paid so poorly in a country that has so much? Because many of us benefit from that situation. You know, I read the novelist uh, Tommy Orange, his first book there, there, and he has a line there that says, you know, kids are jumping out of the windows of burning buildings, falling to their deaths. And we think the problem is they're jumping. You know, and when I read that, I was like, man, that sounds like the poverty debate. You know, we constantly focus on the poor. We should be focusing on the fire. You know, who lit it? Who's warming their hands by it? And I think that's a sentence that cuts through the complexity arguments. You know, some lives are made small so that others may grow. And that's just the plain truth of it. Matthew, you have a couple of quotes from Tolstoy in the book that are yeah. so lovely. Um, my favorite one um, is this. I sit on a man's back, choking him and making him carry me, and yet assure myself and others that I'm very sorry for him and I wish to ease his lap by all possible means except by getting off his back. How do we create or exacerbate or, or perpetuate the, the poverty of, of other, other people in this country? So a lot of times when you think about the welfare state, what the government does for us, we think about things like food stamps, public housing, makes sense. But a lot of us actually get a lot of help from the government. You know, if we take means-tested programs, these are programs for the poorest Americans, and we add those up with social insurance programs, these like what a lot of us get, social security, but also tax breaks. We gotta count those too. And I know that's kind of weird, you know, sometimes, but, you know, both a tax break and a check from the government, they both contribute to the deficit, cost the government something, and they both put money in our pocket. And so when we do that, you learn that, you know, the average family in the bottom 20% of the income distribution, our poorest families, they get about $26,000 a year from the government. But our richest families, the families in the top 20%, they get about $35,000 a year from the government. And so I think we do have to face the fact that a lot of us receive help from the government and don't really recognize it until the government puts those pro programs on the chopping block and then we suddenly get up in arms. So this is like a way we contribute to poverty because you know if we did a lot more to fight poverty as a nation instead of guarding fortunes and instead of like you know giving most to families that don't need it, we can make a ton of difference. But a lot of us protect those benefits. You know we like them. I'm interested in the way that we tend to think about the working poor and the way we talk about the working poor. Uh, in, this is in, in the 1780s, mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Townsend, the writer, he said, the poor lack pride, honor, and ambition. And then uh, 200 years later in the 1980s, the Smiths sang, although I think it was tongue in cheek, the poor and the needy are selfish and greedy. Why has that image lasted for, for so long? Yeah, I think that's like the propaganda of capitalism in a way. You know, the early capitalists had a problem, right? How to take folks that were, you know, living on their land, getting by just fine, 
uh, and move them into, into factories or into the coal mines or into mills. You know, that's a, that's a big problem. And the solution was hunger. You know, kind of enclose that land, take that away, make them have to work for their, for their wages. And so when capitalism arose, you needed a big government. You know, you needed laws, you needed tariffs, you needed armies to protect, you know, uh, property. But a big government could also hand out bread. And so this is where this kind of language starts, this idea of like, you know, that bread's going to make people lazy, which means that bread's going to not allow folks to come work for, for me. And that kind of propaganda has been repeated over and over throughout the year. If we're going to end poverty in America, which is what I want to do, I want to end it, uh, some folks are going to have to take a little less from the government, you know? But I think what they get from that is they get a safer country. They get a more vibrant country. They get a freer country, right? They get a country where they don't have to worry that their kid might fall all the way down the ladder into real, real hardship. So I think that, you know, this is not going to come without sacrifice. But I think a lot of us, even those of us very secure in our money, are pining for this. Like, think of all, like, the, the engineers and scientists and computer whizzes that poverty has is, is robbed from us and cost us. So I think, I think unlocking that potential is a win for a lot of folks. Let, let's talk about some of those people. Let's talk about some, some poor people. The book has real people, uh, people whose stories are, are, are complicated um, and whose money runs low. Uh, there's Crystal Mayberry. Yeah. Uh, there's your friend Wu. Yeah. There's your dad. Yeah. He was a pastor. Uh, I think he could read ancient Greek. Um, and then he loses his job. And the bank, I think, took, took the home you grew up in. Yeah. How did losing something that your family owned, how, how did it shape you in the way you see the world? I think it made me confused, you know, about why this is how the country dealt with a family when they fall, fell on hard times. You know, my childhood home was $60,000, you know? And so I think that when that happened, when we lost our home, I blame my dad. Have you ever talked to your dad about that? Have you ever talked to him about the anger you felt? Yeah, I think so, you know? And I think that, to be honest, it's hard to, to get completely over that, even when you study it all day long. I think it's hard to really walk away from that. You know, talking about poverty in the abstract, you know, that's one thing, but talking about poverty when it comes to someone with a name and a face who's fully human, which means they make mistakes. You know, that's, that's something that's more challenging, yeah. I was really moved by something in the book uh, that's, that's really selfish of me. Um, you cite the work that my colleagues and I did um, on overdraft fees. Yeah. Um, it's a way that some of the biggest banks uh, in the world make just billions of dollars from some of the poorest people. Um, overdraft fees are now declining, mm. um, although they're definitely not going away entirely. What are other concrete changes you'd like to see from, from companies, from big companies mm -hmm. um, in the finance industry and, or, or beyond to, to help abolish poverty? I think we do have to end the unrelenting exploitation of the poor in the financial sector. You know, overdraft fees are declining, but that's only because savings went up during COVID, you know, because the enormous government relief packages. And as that money's dry, drying up, I think it's, we're gonna see kind of an uptick again. Every year, about $11 billion in overdraft fees in a normal, normal time. You know, most of that is charged just 9% of bank customers. The poor made to pay for their poverty. We got to stop that. And we have to also ask ourselves, like you, me, and a lot of folks, you know, like, are we, are we benefiting from this? Is my free checking account actually free or is it, you know, subsidized? But that's a concrete change, though. I, I think $11 billion, I think might have been a couple years ago. I'm gonna to have to check, but I wanna say off the top of my head, I think it fell to eight yeah. uh, last year. Um, might have been the year before that. And I think it's gonna keep falling. It's, it's a rare example, I think. Um, you know, when I read your book, a lot of it can, can be um, disheartening. Mm -hmm. And I've, I think of overdraft fees as like maybe a concrete reason to be optimistic, that like change actually does sometimes happen in, in profound ways. Well, I would love for you to be right on that, truly, truly. You know, we saw savings go up a lot during COVID. You know, in COVID, we had two years where we were a different country. Like, you know, most people were more financially secure during the pandemic than before it. And so I think that one of the trends you're seeing, I think, in, in the overdraft fees might be a response to that. Savings went up. Folks started businesses during the pandemic, actually. A lot of bad indicators went down. And probably the most 
powerful thing for us is, you know, we cut child poverty in half. We cut child poverty in half in six months. And then we just let those programs go away. Your book and exactly what you're talking about now, I mean, it, it did make me reconsider poverty as like kind of an existential threat mm. that, that faces our country, you know? But the climate disaster is getting worse. Mm -hmm. The whole kind of experiment of American democracy seems kind of iffy sometimes. Um, and, and, then, and then to consider poverty as, as a, um, yeah, an, an existential threat to our country is, is scary. Besides overdraft fees, what reasons do you have to feel a sense of, yeah, a, a sense of optimism, a sense of hope? I think the American people are done with us. They're done with our old, tired myths about poverty. I think on the ground level, neighbor to neighbor, there's a lot of folks that want more equity, less poverty, you know? The survey data show that like most Americans think the minimum wage is too low. Most Americans think the rich aren't paying their fair share of taxes, they're right. Most Democrats and most Republicans today think that poverty is a result of unfair circumstances, not a moral failing, not something that I did. That's a sea change. So there's something happening in the American public now. And I think translating that to political action is the challenge. But what is happening on the ground level, I think, should give us hope. You know, before you go uh, on that note, when, when, you're, when you're writing or, or when you're talking, I'm betting that your audience is engaged in what you're saying, and I bet that they really care about it. Um, are you learning to connect with people who aren't or people who, who don't? And do you have, a, do you have ideas about how, how you wanna try? I think one of, the, one of the challenges I'm facing out, you know, on the book tour is you'll get those sympathetic readers and they'll say, I read this book and I, yeah, I'm with you, but, but my uncle, my, oh my, my uncle would hate this. Or, you know, or, it's the, this political party, oh my God, or I'm just so hopeless. There's like a lot of like chic nihilism, you know, like pessimism's cool now, you know? And I think that overcoming that is a challenge, you know, moving, moving past that and getting folks into action is a challenge. I think I'm trying to do everything I can to talk to audiences outside of the, the tent. This is something that I'm obsessed with. So I'll go anywhere where, with folks that disagree with me, that, that don't share my views and try to, try to access that in, in any way I can. Well, you'll go to lots of tables, but I'm glad you're at this one. Matthew Desmond, thank you so much for being here. No, thanks for this conversation. Really enjoy it. Yeah, me too. The problem with really trying to own the question of ownership is that it would take longer than half an hour to really think through the basic parts, money, politics, bankruptcy, theft, and more. Our guests tonight pointed the way to an answer. If you really want to succeed as a business owner, not just running something successfully, but being a part of a community, it will mean thinking through who you are, where your ideas come from, who your workers are, and how you fit into something bigger. And if you really want to thrive, it will mean thinking through the reasons that things are working for you and thinking through all the things that may have to change. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you next time. I am the most greedy when I really want to write something and everything else is preventing that. Um, yeah, that's when I become a greedy writing monster. If my alter ego had a name for a sandwich, it would be Happy Ho. <laughs>